Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to the first episode of Legal Ease after our Ramadan break. Peace be upon you. Tonight I'll be joined by Muhammad Kara who has been involved in the teaching profession for at least the past 26 years. Thereafter he was five years in a managerial position for Sterkinico Cinemas and 12 years at JSS as a teacher in, in the Commerce Department. He spent 11 years at the University of Johannesburg in the Faculty of Management, the Department of Business Management, and he was the coordinator of the first year students across all faculties in the course of business management. He lectured on the program as well, and he was involved in lecturing in the extracurricular program of training people that were working and studying part-time. Presently, he works at Rosebank College, uh, and that is in the brand of the IE, Independent Institute of Education, a private higher education provider. He's also a head of department in the Faculty of Business at the Auckland Park campus. He lectures third year course on entrepreneurship currently, and he has a qualification being um, a higher diploma in education, which he obtained in WITS in the Commerce Faculty, and a further computer, a diploma in computer literacy from Rao, as it was, a BA in humanities from Rao, a BA honors uh, from Rao, and then he's uh, involved in the honors development program in labor relations from, he's obtained that from UNISA School of Business Leadership, is a BCom in business management, and from UJ, as it is now known, and uh, he's working in progress with his PhD. And he's going to be joining us uh, in a very interesting subject, something that has made the news all of this week and last week with young entrepreneurs getting involved in the 702 Walk to Talk. In fact, today there were a number of announcements about how this country and indeed most parts of the economies of the world can be turned around by small and medium enterprises, SMMEs. To help us understand this pro program and the legal compliance issues that entrepreneurs will have to meet, I'd like to say welcome to Mohammed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shif jazakallah for the opportunity to the viewers of ITV as well. Welcome. Thank you and welcome, Mohammed. Mohammed, legal aspects uh, governing entrepreneurship, it's, a, it's a quite a complex topic. Where would we start from? Let's say, uh, and we're speaking to the would-be would -be entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and the existing entrepreneurs that really want to succeed in whatever they're doing. Where would they start from? It really is a minefield. And, and I think at the end of the day, if a person has to basically just look at what has to be done, then the issue becomes very really complex for a simple person that has just decided to start up an organization. Um, let's start at the basic level where we can say that if you've decided to pick uh, to, to, to on the type of ownership that you want, where you get a sole ownership or right. sole proprietor, um, that is venture free. You don't have to fill in any forms. You can start up with immediate effect. When you look at, for example, a partnership, yeah. there has to be some kind of a legal agreement between the partners involved right. um, in, the, in the process. And yes, I'm going to stipulate that it has to be a written contract because it can become binding right. in terms of how the organization or the business is going to basically function. Lastly, then it is to look at a company and you get different forms of companies. Right. But that process has to start, off, for example, with um, a company registry, uh, regist registering itself with the Companies of Intellectual Property Commission, or CIPC. Right. It was previously known as CIPRO. Yeah. So these are all the sort of legal jargons that, that, that an entrepreneur has to encounter initially when we start off. Now, just now for legal purposes, mm. there are various risk elements attaching to each of these entities. For yeah. example, partners and sole proprietors are personally liable. Absolutely. Whereas in a, in a corporate entity like a company that you register with SIPs, the company is liable. The, the, the per partners or the person's the personal component, yes. assets are not uh, endangered or attachable if something goes Absolutely. Up. For a person that's opening up a sole trader or a sole proprietorship, what happens then is that um, you know any profits that you make, you are liable to pay tax. Right. And if, for example, um, that you are an employee and you're drawing a salary from yes. that organization, then you also have to be registered as a taxpayer. Right. So that's the twofold. If you've got people working for you mm -hmm. um, in a sole proprietor, then they have to be registered for tax as well. Right. But there are certain 
um, aspects where if uh, people are under uh, a certain threshold of, of, of uh, salary, I think it's yes. about 14,000, mm. and a person over the age of 62, for example, uh, then you don't have to register with SARS. But automatically, the minute that you start in, in, in run a business, right. you need to be basically registered with SARS. So on the first aspect, there's the, the, the tax component. Right. And as you correctly said, that in a partnership in a, in a, a sole trader, mm -hmm. the people are basically liable for what happens um, in, in running that business. So partners in the own capacity will also have to pay tax on any kind of profits or any kind of salaries that they draw. Then when we go a little bit further, you also need to understand that that becomes uh, a compliance. Um, and there again, there are legislation that has to be basically fulfilled by a small organization to the mm -hmm. extent that if, for example, you, you firstly have to look at the threshold for wh when you basically register for VET. Mm -hmm. Um, and then what happens is that you have to do a calculation on a monthly basis about VAT income right. or VAT input and VAT output. Now, a very practical example will be, um, let's say LG makes a, um, a fridge right. and they sell it to a wholesaler. Yeah. Um, but in the making of that fridge, that fridge may have cost them um, 2,000 rand. Right. And they add a bit of a profit onto the making of that fridge of about, let's say, 56 rand or whatever the case right. may be. And then Game or Dion or somebody buys that fridge. Right. And they have to basically pay VAT to, um, to LG to a certain extent as well. But that's not the issue. So let's say then the total price of, of, of uh, that, that fridge now, uh, they've added on 196 rand. Right. So in total, you're now paying for a fridge about 2,280 rand. Right. Okay. Or on 2,000 rand. Now when it comes to you buying that fridge as a consumer. Yes. You then have to pay VAT on that. Um, right. And what happens then is the complication comes in where you need to pay that VAT. Yes. And then you need to also look at how much VAT you paid as a, as a, as a trader. Yeah. And what were the suppliers portions of that VAT as well. Okay. And you need to reconcile the two and then pay over to the uh, receiver of revenue or SARS over two monthly period. Okay. So those kind of things can become very intensive for a person that just started out a business. Okay. But uh, the best thing that I would start by advocating Ashraf is yeah. for a person that's starting a business, two very important components are in, uh, need to be in place. Yeah. One is have a mentor. Okay. And by that simply go out and look for people that have started uh, entrepreneurship or have started out their own businesses. Speak to them. Speak to as many people as possible that you can get information which basically enables you to do things much easier right and and you learn from the process because you're going to have lots of trials and tribulations mm -hmm. and lots of um faults and and you're going to make mistakes right. you're human and i think from that purpose also the second most important person to to get hold of is mm. to have a lawyer now okay. for a small person for a person starting a small business for the first time right. that can be quite a challenge in terms of uh, managing constraints but you also need to take a lot of legal advice because as you go into the whole um um how can I say, the, 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 the landscape of yes. entrepreneurship, you find many obstacles that are there that okay. you're going to encounter. Um, and we're going to try and sort of break up the program and we can discuss these over you know, okay. a, a period of time so that people have a chance to understand how these things impact on a business as you're starting off. So let's, talk, let's go back to CIPC. Now, where does one get hold of CIPC and are there documents to be filled out? Do you need any specific person? Do you need an auditor to form a company? Can you do it yourself? W what advice would you give to the entrepreneur there? Okay, CIPC is based out in Pretoria, okay? And what was formerly known as CIPRO uh, is now known as the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission, CIPC. Right. And for example, one of the things that you need to do is you need to reserve a name. Right. And f just for reserving a name, you have what is called the COR 9.1. Okay, known as a defensive name. And what happens here is that sometimes you'll read uh, that people tell you or you read magazines or you read articles on, on, on the internet that tell you that you should choose four names and submit four names. Right. And one of them will be basically reserved and that becomes the trading name of your organization. Um, only one name will be able to be reserved at any point in time. And then the whole purpose of that reserved name means that only you can use that name and nobody's entitled to use okay. that name besides you. Now, the new thinking in this uh, uh, regard, yes. is, it, is it not better to have a name uh, that identifies what you're doing, uh, um, let's say principal business, but also one that you might be able to register as a trademark later on, uh, you know, in that kind of way, so that you, you, you're creating a brand and a business name 
but you're creating a possible trademark or a registration of this to give you better protection. Basically, those are, that's a twofold um, uh, aspect that you need to consider. The, the, the name itself is what people are going to um, identify your business with. But the registered trademark, um, you know, that slogan that identifies the service or goods that the person is actually selling becomes a distinguishing um, mark for that business itself. Right. Now, examples of that will be Coca-Cola, uh, your Nike store, your Wimpy Hamburger logo. All those are basically the brand yes. names. So you need to look at the logo that's going to basically incorporate the essence of what your business is about so that people can associate your trademark or with the business. Or it could be outstanding. For Absolutely. example, Apple has got nothing to do with computers, but sure. they took Apple and they branded Apple. 100%. And the company is, yeah. is known as Apple. 100%. Yeah. So those are issues that, that you need to consider firstly. Then it's also the publicizing of your business venture. And there it becomes important that you have signage, proper signage for people to know exactly what your business is about. Right. And the, the aspect here that you need to consider most of all is that that signage might be visible wherever you're the frontage of your shop, for example, or your business where it's situated. Secondly, the full name, it has to be displayed on all the notices or any official documents or publications, right. checks, order forms, your letterheads, your delivery notes, your credit notes. Um, they have to bear the, the, so the name of So just to be it. clear, so, right? Yeah. It has to have the name of the company as well as the registration number. Yes. Otherwise, you actually visit it with personal liability. You, w yes. What you're trying to get away from is personal liability. And if you fail to display, it doesn't have to be prominent, but it has to be displayed. 100%. The name as well as the registration number of that entity on all legal documents and all signages facing the public so the public may easily identify you. I think a lot of people overlook this on their vehicles. Absolutely, because the, you know it, it becomes a, a that, that registration number is where people want to get hold of your company, know whether right. your company is legal or not. Yes, and that makes a very big difference. And I think that's, that has to be basically um, looked at. Um, make sure that everything is very clearly stipulated for people to know exactly what your business is about. Okay, Mohammed, that'll be a convenient place to stop. Please stay tuned. We're going for a short break. Join us after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and peace be upon you and welcome back to the second quarter of Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease and tonight I am joined by Mohammed Kara who is a, a really an expert in the field of legal compliance for entrepreneurs. He's helping us to understand what the entrepreneur needs, what tools will he need to succeed as an entrepreneur, not just from a legal compliance issue. Uh, tonight you invited to call him to discuss any aspect that you might want to discuss regarding small businesses or medium-sized enterprises, uh, what issues you may have. He has a wealth of knowledge on branding, on how you should get your business out there to succeed. And I remind you that the number for you to call in is 11 86 Double seven, double seven, and the number appears on your screen. Now, Mohammed, just before the break, we were talking about uh, the necessity of putting the registration numbers and the names on on all visible signages mm -hmm. uh, that you interface with members of the public, and mm -hmm. the importance of that. Now, let's move on to uh, the uh, other issues. When a, when you form a company. There are certain documents that you must have. M must you have a memorandum of some kind or a shareholders agreement or what documents are required? Okay, without confusing the layman, what happens is that when companies are formed, they can either be a public or private company. Right. But we won't get into all those kind of just details yes. now. But when a company is formed, first thing that you need is a articles of association. Right. They concern with the internal management of the company and they will deal with things uh, like shares, how many shares are going to be work, uh, or the lending powers, or the meeting procedures, your voting right. rights, all those kind of things are very, very important. And they must be set out in a prescribed form that you get from CIPC. Okay. Then the next thing you move on to is the memorandum of association. And um, I learned something from you in the break. It's now ref uh, referred to as the memorandum of incorporation. Right. And what happens here is that the name of the company Yes. Right, apply f uh, for prior to registration. There you need a form CM5, which right. you can get from the CIPC. 
This form will basically, it must describe the main purpose objective of the business. Now again, for the layman, when you're reading books, they talk sometimes about the vision and mission. This is where you're starting to just say what yes. the company is going to be about. Okay. Uh, the amount of the initial registered share capital, your initial share capital that you're raising in uh, is, is your, your startup capital in the company. Right. And any powers of authority legally entitled that need to be excluded or qualified. Now, what we mean by that is that... Um, you may have had contracts before you started your organization or right. before the registration process. So they have to be basically brought into... For example, you entered into a lease agreement yes. for your shop. absolutely. And that but has to the be... registration yes. process. Yes, it's important that those kind of things be included in your memorandum right. of association so that, um, you know, you, you're already starting on the right foot because if you leave any of these things out, they can create complications for you later. Right. Okay. Then, furthermore, it's also a case of saying... Um, that in your uh, your memorandum of, of association or uh, incorporation, um, adoption or ratification, as you said, of pre-incorporated contracts, right. any powers of authority legally entitled that uh, to that need to be excluded or qualified again. So again, just make sure that you you you've taken care of all the the the, the things that CPIC uh, require of you. Special terms and conditions regarding operation of the company. Right. Okay? And then an association clause stating the wish to form a company in agreement to take up shares. Okay. So again, that comes in with the aspect of if you're going for a, a, a public company, right. then you're opening up shares to general public. Right. If you're going for a private company, but even those terms today, you will find that they use terms like closely held and widely held companies. That's in terms of the new Companies Act. Right. Um, one of the things that we need to bear in mind, before I go on any further, is that we used to have CCs or close corporations. Right. But since the incorporation of the new Companies Act 2008, what has happened is that um, no more CCs will be registered, right. but existing CCs have to now basically convert it to companies. Okay, so it doesn't actually company. make sense to buy a so-called shelf CC. You people used to buy that. Absolutely. Because now you're going to have to convert yeah. back to a company. It was There were a lot of loopholes that were created with CCs, and right. then the government tried to close that loophole down very, very quickly because... Um, for, for, for various for different various reasons. reasons. Right, okay. And then what happens also is some of the documents that's required. Now, you've got this Form CM5. Yeah. Okay? That will state the, the approved and reserved name, and if necessary, it translates or abbreviated name. Right. That's something that you were mentioning earlier about maybe there's a registered trademark or yes. something to say. For example, if lawyers get together, they can have INC next to the name which yes. is incorporated. That's it right. also deals with the component of, of limited liability. Right. Um, the same way that when you form a public company, there's limited liability. So if you invested 10000 in a public company, yeah. your loss will only be 10000 They can't touch your assets yes. um, or any of your personal belongings. Whereas if you're a sole trader in a partnership, um, if you as a partner get involved yeah. with an uh, agreement, yes. then you can be held liable in your personal capacity. Personal. And uh, as far as the sole trader is concerned, he or she bears all the losses and profits in the business. Right. Then the physical office and postal address is on form CM22, which is also very important. Now, all these forms, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it has to be basically collected from the CIPC. Right. So you don't collect it in stages. You collect the whole lot of forms, fill them in as much detail as possible. Can you download I can, them? I, they are downloadable. Um, but from some of my interaction with people that have had uh, association with CIPRO, it's better to go there. Right. Um, and, and collect all the forms and make sure that all the documentation is filled in correctly because if you take it back yeah. and one piece of documentation is not full, uh, filled in, yes. they're going to send you back again until you have done it properly. So, so but let, let's, I mean, uh, CIPRO is, uh, SIPS is uh, based in Pretoria and you are uh, an entrepreneur in uh, Northern Kimberley. I mean, how do you get there? You, do you, uh, can you appoint an agent to go and fill out these forms for you? Well, you can, you can appoint a proxy, but I think in, in initially when starting this whole process, you right. need to do it on your own because it becomes a learning process for you. Okay. Depending on the kind of organization or the, the business venture that you want to start up, and if you're going the company route, then it's important that you go yourself because there are certain times when you have to, if you're the sole director in that company, then you mm. have to sign. Yes. And nobody can be a proxy in terms okay. of your... Uh, authority because you are now becoming um, the person that's who's going to be handling the contracts right. and so forth. So they have to deal with the person that's basically the director of the company. So those kind of things can be important. Um, where you basically can have a proxy, um, if, for example, people cannot sign personally, then you have to have proxy forms before you register again, okay. which then informs SIPs that these are people that are going to be signing on behalf of other people in the organization. Right. So again, that you have to just make sure that you cover yourself with regard to those kind of things. Okay. Then furthermore, what SIPs will require from you? Um, and once these documents are in order, they will uh, issue a certificate to, uh, to operate after receiving 
uh, an application for the certificate to commence business. That's a CM46 form that you need to fill in. Okay. A statement by the director testifying that the issued share capital of the company is sufficient to conduct its business. Yes. That's on a CM47 form. The particulars of the directors and other officers of the company on form CM29. Okay. And then consent form and audit. And I think this is a point we just need to, to stop a bit. When you got a company, initially you did not have to have audited financial statements. Right. But with the New Companies Act now, it's important, it's imperative that you do um, submit annual returns okay. on stipulated dates. Um, you know that, that you also have to make sure it doesn't take long. It's a tedious procedure, but you have to do it. And that's the reason why on a CM41, a 31 form that you get from uh, SIPS, yeah. that you have to basically have the consent from an auditor. Okay that mm -hmm. he or she is going to be the official auditor of the company. So these kind of things are important to have in place because, like I said, you're going to go there without any these forms. They're going to send you back and say, sorry, come with the right information the first time. But the small trader might say, this is very, very onerous. This is too difficult to do. I now have to employ auditors. There's a cost. I have to employ attorneys. There's a cost. I've got to go to Pretoria. There's a cost. I think what you're saying is, get used to being compliant because if you want to be a properly registered or successful entrepreneur, this is part of what you're going to do. The paperwork is important. It's a learning process. Okay. And, and you know, they say that, that no work is done until the paperwork, paperwork done. is done. But I think that's an important consideration to take into, into account. The fact that from the beginning, make sure you know what you're getting yourself in for. Your mindset must be there that you're going to have trials and challenges, even just starting up your company right. at that initial stage. And if you can get through these hurdles, it becomes a valuable learning lesson for you to understand the process is much better. And by you as an entrepreneur engaging in these yourself, yeah. it's first-hand learning. Mm -hmm. Now, Mohamed, you have a lot of practical experience regarding what makes uh, entrepreneurs successful. What, what, you know, on the way here, we were listening to a show on, on the radio, and they were also speaking about uh, the 13 lessons that were learned from the children that participated in the it was 702. Yeah. And, and children under the age of 15. And, and yeah. you were saying something that uh, that entrepreneurial spirit is stifled. I mean, that you should actually find your passion. Look, there's a lot of home industries. People operate from home. People operate from caravans. People operate from the boot of their cars. These are all serial entrepreneurs. Even the one selling you fruit and veg on the street corner is an entrepreneur. Absolutely. He's found a niche and he's... Addressing that. And talk to us about finding the niche. I think it's important that we, we, if you are considering, and I think today a lot of people are having to look at that option of, of looking at starting their own businesses because people are getting retrenched. Yes. It's very difficult to get an, a job in a hurry. Um, they need income to survive because it's supporting their families and so forth. Mm -hmm. So they look at other options where they can actually get involved in other forms of, of, of uh, um, uh, making income. And that presents the opportunity for people to say, firstly, start by saying to yourself, what talents do I have? And recognize yourself for the talents that you have because those talents can be turned into money-making ideas. And I think that's important as a starting point. Um, as an entrepreneur, you need to be visionary. Right. Uh, you can have a dream, that's one thing, but you need to have a vision of being in a certain space at a certain point in time and working towards that. Right. So you have realistic goals and realistic objectives. Your objectives can be short-term, to say that this is what I need to achieve mm -hmm. in the next two or three months, then I'm going to set myself another yeah. objective until I reach my goals. What you cannot do is get into a mindset to say, well, I'm opening up a business to make money. And I think that is what we need to start moving away from because it's, it's more than that. You will see the rewards, but they're going to come at a the cost. Right. They're going to come at a burden to you and your family. Your family, your loved ones need to understand that. If we go back and look at our Indian communities, we saw family businesses that were yes. established. And they got passed down from grandfather to father to son. Right. What was very interesting in our African communities, Ashraf, is mm. when I did some uh, lecturing at, at the Soweto campus right. and engaging with the students, you found that in our African communities in Soweto, the most common types of businesses were your shubin, um, your undertaking business and a photography business. And okay. the reason for that was that there was a very negative um, connotation associated with entrepreneurs that failed. Okay. And I think that has changed over time where we're seeing, uh, um, I think, an increase yes. in, in African entrepreneurs that have come to the forefront. Right. Now, you look at somebody like Raman Mashaba. Yes. Um, in the 1970s, he identified a need. It was a, a need that basically every single 
uh, African person in this country uh, needed. He came up with products called Black Like Me. Right. He's been an entrepreneur for all his life. He only employs four people, including himself. That's remarkable. Today. And he's still a very humble person. From the people that I've spoken to, they've met him. He goes, you go into his office, and his office is very, you know, simple. simply simple. And, right. and the humility is is basically transcended in the way he basically carries himself. But he's also very outspoken about the reason why entrepreneurship is so stifled in South Africa. And that reason being that we have very rigid labor laws. Now we may not be able to cover them this week or maybe right. in a future show. But it's important to understand how those. Uh, regulations can stifle uh, uh, somebody that has uh, entrepreneurial spirit. So, I mean, in a way, that is a challenge. Um, but just, uh, you know, to, to recap, uh, when we started, we spoke about finding a mentor and getting a lawyer, and perhaps an, an, uh, an accountant and auditor as well. But I think it's also important to find somebody who understands business uh, like, like you do. I mean, you lecture in that field, you understand the legal compliance issues, but uh, I'd like the uh, viewers to benefit by practical advice. Mm -hmm. If you could give, what practical advice could you give to the housewife who's got a, a fantastic recipe for ginger beer that she's got from generation to generation now. People don't really uh, uh, look for artisanal sure. ginger beer, but sure. surely there's a market for health goods. People are, are involved in, uh, in looking after their health and eat only certain kinds of goods. There's, mm -hmm. there's opportunities every day. What advice would you give to those people? I think firstly, we need to look at it from a perspective that yes, you, m you may have a very good product that you make. Right. But it's not necessarily the product that the that customer everyone needs. everyone wants, right. needs. So okay, so the customer's needs. It becomes of vital importance. Right. For example, your starting point would be to go out into your community and ask people, to right. say, what do you need? What type of products um, would you benefit from? Right. Okay. What's going to make your life easier if you hate these type of things? Okay. And by listening to people, that's a form of market research. What happens then is that uh, you can start looking okay. at ideas of how to basically make this more right. practical. So on that point, I'd like us to just pause. It's time to go for another break. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum and peace be upon you. You are reminded that you are tuned to Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. Tonight I'm joined by Mohammed Kara, who is helping us to understand what legal aspects or what legal compliance issues faces an entrepreneur. And just before the break, we were talking about uh, various opportunities that uh, their entrepreneurs have, especially those that operate from home. Now, Mohammed, when you when you running a home industry, surely there must be some legal compliance. There must be some issues that are very important. Tell us about that. Just before the break, we started talking about housewives that may have ideas. Yes. So let's say there are housewives that feel that they can make very good food. Yeah. And suddenly they start making it on a small scale. They're selling their products. Right. And then it gets too big for them to handle. Mm. And then they have to basically decide that they want to um, maybe renovate the house to make it bigger to right. incorporate. Now, before those kind of things can happen, you need to apply for a license, a trading okay. license. So you've gone through the registration process, you now need to have a, a trading license. Like I said, for, for a sole trader, very simple. Right. But you must apply for a trading license in terms of the Business Act of 1991. Okay. okay? That you get three types of licenses, the sale or supply of meals or perishable food stuff. Okay. Or you must have a license for the provision of certain types of health facilities or entertainment. I'm not going to go into detail with those things. All right. These forms are available. And the last one is hawking in meals or perishable foodstuffs. Oh, okay. So those type of things are very, very important and they must be covered now. What that can result in, um, so you get two types of form there, so before I go on. You get an L1 form, it must be completed and submitted to your local municipality for licensing. Okay. And once that form is basically ratified, then you will be issued an L2 form, which is the actual license okay. for you to start uh, trading. Then also what will happen is the licensing department may send around people to go and look at your premises. Mm -hmm. Now, together with that, you also have to apply for zoning because this is what happens. You may live in a house and now you feel that you want to conduct business from the house because remember the two major expenses 
that people have in, in, in a business yes. are your salaries and your rent. rent yes. And if you can uh, basically reduce your rental by paying for a lease or whatever, yeah. and you can do it from home, you save yourself a considerable amount of money, sure. you then have to basically look at rezoning. So okay. that means that you need to go through your municipal process, the local municipalities, you need to go to the town planning process as well. Right. And you, ask, you have to ask for rezoning rights. The problem here can be a wait of about a year. Okay. before those kind of things are. So that, that could so be again, very frustrating. Very, very frustrating. Right. In the meantime, you want to make money, but you are being inhibited from right. doing that again because of the legal aspects. Okay. So I think it's just important to understand these things as well. And um, basically what can happen is that if you do not accede to these and you conduct, conduct your business and uh, um, a town planning inspector or whoever walks on your right. premises, you can be liable to be fined. Okay. And some of those fines range from between 10,000 to 500,000 rent. That can, so that can put you out of business absolutely, immediately. Totally. Then as well, if you're going to be dealing with food, the health department has to come in and check. Right. You need to also have clearance from the fire department. And okay. then you need to have renewals okay. on a yearly basis. So that itself can become quite a... So basically what you're task. saying, uh, I mean, not even a spaza shop in theory can operate without absolutely. a license. Eh? You need to do things the legal way. And I think mm. this is what the, 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 the Minister of Small Business has yes. been established now with that intent purpose to make sure that there's a lot of regulation right. around small businesses, especially your kind of spaza shops yeah. and those kind of things, and, and vendors, and you know, yes. so that there's, there's some kind of regulation that basically they have to adhere to as well. Right. Okay. Now, as part of your <coughs> compliance, right, apart from licenses, I think the most important compliance and the nightmare that faces people is SARS. Absolutely. I mean... Tell us about that. Well, with SARS, what do you need to basically have to contend with? Firstly, income tax on income derived from operating the business. Mm. So any profits you make, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you have to pay tax on that. Right. Now, if you're earning a, a salary, depending on the kind of salary scale that you're working on, you can pay 28% and up to 40%. Right. In terms of your increase in your salary. So just, just, to, um, just to unpack that, right? <coughs> oh, excuse me. a director is an employee. Mm -hmm. of the company. Yes. He can also be the shareholder, but he mustn't get confused when in his role as a director. Mm -hmm. Directors are taking salaries and shareholders take profit, profit at dividend. dividends at least. Right. Yes. Now, importantly, if you as a, as a director and you're earning in the capacity of 120,000 rand, you're going to be paying 40% tax. Right. That's right? huge. So again, it is huge. So you know? what, what can you do to reduce the tax burden legally? Legally? <laughs> well, uh, um, no, I mean, I there are expenses that the, company, uh, um, that, a company, that the company can write off in the running of that business. 100%. So, so you, 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 can, you can take your gross profits, but there are expenses that you can deduct from there. Cost of goods, uh, uniforms, yeah. uh, equipment. The, the reason uh, for, for, for just laughing out loud was the fact that you can have tax avoidance and tax evasion. Yes. And one of them is illegal. Yes. So we just need to basically get that right. Avoidance is legal. Evasion is, is illegal. illegal. Yeah. So for the listeners as well, I think it's important to bear in mind. When you look at your, your, your expenses that you can deduct, for example, the cost of developing, purchasing or registering a patent. Right. That can be deducted. Okay. Very important. Um, so the cost of registering, mm -hmm. developing and? Purchasing. And purchasing. Design a trademark or copyright to be used in the business. You can deduct that as an expense. Okay. The rental of land, buildings, plant or machinery and royalties for firms, or for firms, patent designs and trademarks used in the production of your income. Okay. So any rental. Manufacturers may deduct depreciation on wear and tear of 20% per annum on a straight line basis. Now those accountants out there, you know about straight line and diminishing uh, balance method. The straight line basically means 20% every year, so you're deducting and you, and you basically take that off. An allowance equal to 50% of the cost of building housing for employees, not more than 6,000 per annum. Mm -hmm. So if you're giving a housing allowance to your employees, that right. is a deductible expense. Okay. Interest paid on loans used for the production of income. If you're doing any kind of leverage to buy new machinery or whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. some of that... Is commission, um, is commission an uh, expense? I would think it is. Mm -hmm. I, may, I stand corrected in terms of that, but I would think that commission is an expense because it's, it's paid out in lieu of income derived from the company. Mm -hmm. Um, furthermore, depreciation or wear tear allowances on vehicles, equipments and articles used in the business. So over the years, your depreciation of your motor vehicles, your computers, your furniture and equipment over time. A proportion of the private home expense if part of your home is used for business purposes, right. including rent, rates, telephone and cleaning costs. But remember, but again, earlier we spoke about getting the license, 100%. getting compliance. Then only you then can only take it Then only then these become deductible expenses. So for, right. for housewives contemplating that, 
Again, do your homework, do it correctly, do it right the first time so right. that you don't run into any kind of problems later. Mm -hmm. Then revenue expenditure and scientific research done during or development. This is to do with research and development. Okay. Now, this is a twofold impact because research and development, for example, coffee, it took 22 years before coffee came onto the market. Right. But how much money was spent in, in, in trying to develop that? With our pharmaceutical companies as well, research and development is a large part yes. of the component. And that's why sometimes medicines are very expensive because they need to re, uh, regroup that money right. or recuperate it uh, funds again. So those kind of things we need to also um, okay. understand how they can impact. Then traveling expenses incurred on behalf of the business. But here again, in terms of legislation, in terms of SARS, make mm. sure you have a logbook. Make sure that you record your miles yes. correctly. If it's uh, in your private capacity and for a vehicle, it's a, uh, the business vehicle. So you need to make sure because SARS are going to ask you for logbooks in terms of where you've traveled. Is it easier now with GPS? I mean, <laughs> GPS logs. Um, I would think so, but then too, they need some kind of written form because you have to have a letter yeah, to, to, to show keep a logbook, that okay. you know, where you used and for what purposes that mm -hmm. uh, intent. Then a percentage reserve on any installment sale debt amount outstanding on the last day of the year. So sometimes some of your bad debts also can yes. be basically taken off. Any compensation paid to Transnet resulting from losses incurred by operating a railway line. Oh. Now, for example, <coughs> I'm thinking along businesses in, in, in the back part of Marisburg. Yes. Where there's still railway lines and so forth. There also, any expenses incurred mm -hmm. can be basically deductible. Annual insurance premiums paid to cover the assets and loss of profit of the business. Right? So that's so tax deductible. Absolutely. Yes. Then uh, legal expenses paid in the course of operating the business, not of a capital nature. Okay. So if you had to do some kind of legal work or any kind of uh, rezoning or any kind of contracts that you basically um, but e suck e up. Even, even even the cost that you incur in pursuing credit uh, debtors to pay, that's a legal yes, expense. Absolutely. That, that is written off. Absolutely. Basically, yeah. Now, again, the further hope, Hopefully, if we can continue the discussion for the listeners, then it's important or for the viewers, it's important to also understand the NPA, right. um, the NCR, the National Credit Regulator, and the, uh, the, the National Consumer Protection Act, which is right. very important. Extremely because important. Because these become very, very important for a, for, a, for a trader and for a business person. Then the repair costs of tools, equipments, and plants used in the business in the right. year in which the repairs occur. So any kind of maintenance okay. deduct deductible. Annual subscriptions to trade and prof professional associations. Okay. So if you belong to societies or associations that are basically enhancing your business, for example, then you are able to take off those deductions as well. Furthermore, um, any expenditure in respect of repairs and pest control in buildings used for business. Okay. Pest okay. control, so yeah. So you have a lot of expenses that can basically bring down mm -hmm. your, um, your, your, your outflow of funds. Right. A 10% initial allowance and a 2% annual allowance on the cost of erecting buildings. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have any kind of renovations done to your premises, those kind of things. Any expenditure include from improving land or buildings which are rented for the purpose of business. Right. So if you build on warehouses, for example, yeah. that you are subletting, mm -hmm. those kind of expenses can be deducted as well. Trade debts that cannot be recovered, we spoke about that. 25% yeah. of the total amount of debtors who are regarded as doubtful. Oh, okay. So, so, so it's something you pro, you you're actually projecting. Yes. It's, it's that in the future I might lose 25% of my... Absolutely. Now, these are all kind of things that you need the assistance in. Like you rightfully said, you don't need a lawyer. Right. But you need to have a very good accountant. Um, okay. And people that you can always basically go and find out. Right. If you don't know something, go and ask. There's somebody that can give you the answer. Good. And I think that's very, very important because you're sometimes in the dark, you don't know what to do. And just asking somebody can just basically make a big difference in the kind of decisions that you make with regard to your business. And that can become very important. Okay. All right, so uh, it's uh, time for another short break. Please stay tuned and join us after the break. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a reminder that you are tr uh, you tuned to Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. And tonight we're joined by Mohammed Kara, who has a huge amount of experience in the field of legal compliance for entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, we're having a problem with the lines and we have to apologize to you that you have not been able to call in. Uh, just before the break, we were talking about various kinds of write-offs that an entrepreneur is entitled to in terms of SARS legislation. And uh, Mohammed has explained to us the various categories. Now, Mohammed, what other um, 
uh, what other tax is 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 a uh, entrepreneur faced with? There's personal tax. There's company okay, tax. Okay, so we've spoken about the, the income tax yes. or personal income tax that we refer to in, yeah. in terms of salaries that you earn. The second important component is what we refer to as value added tax, VAT. Or VAT, yeah. Now, uh, initially when you start the program, I explained, but maybe it's it's important to understand this again. VAT is not what you make in your business. It is what you're collecting on behalf of the government. Right. And that's very, very important to understand. Okay. So it's cal calculated on consumption, and presently at 14%, there is talk about VAT being increased to 17%. Well, I must say in England, there's already VAT-free sales, so it's already happened in England, it's mm. coming in. And uh, uh, consumers are encouraged to buy at the lower rate of VAT because it's definitely going up. But I think because of our economic situation, right. the government has promulgated that it may consider taking it up to 17. Yes. I mean, when you look at countries like Sweden, they pay 25% VAT. Yes. So, now what happens here is that business ventures with an annual turnover in excess of 150,000 must register for VAT. Right. So again, you must have compliance in terms of having your figures on hand to know mm -hmm. what your annual turnover is. 150,000 is a very small amount. I it mean, is. Most businesses is. have to register. Yeah. Yes. And optional for those with annual turnover less than 150,000. So that's okay. an optional process. Then that related to the person from whom SAS collects the tax. Right. So as you as the trader of the or will be the one that will be responsible for paying. Now. <coughs> The whole purpose here is to explain again, like, let's say if you're selling an item for 2,000 Rand and you charge 14% VAT on that, that's 280 Rand. Okay. That is VAT that is basically inclusive in that 2,280 and you need to pay it over to SARS. Oh. But now you need to do a balancing act with VAT input. Yeah. That's where it comes from the original source, where you bought the products from, yeah. and then what you're selling. Right. And the two have to offset each other. And every two months, you now have to basically get through giving information to SARS. Yeah. You have to basically reconcile whether you're owing them or you have to basically get back something in return. Okay. So that reconciliation becomes very, very important. And, right. and SARS are clamping down on people that are evading okay. VAT payments. Uh, each business in the distribution chain pays VAT to SARS in proportion to the value added by that particular business. Right. So that's quite important to understand. The fridge well. example you gave earlier yes. on was very good. In then the other issue that comes to the forefront is capital gains tax. Yes. Mm. Now, I think it must be understood where this originated from is that the government saw that people basically, you, your house was valued at, in 1990 at 100,000. Yeah. But you come to 2015, it's valued at 1.5 million. Right. And if you sell it, you're making a considerable amount of profit. Right. And it's on that profit yes. that the government is saying, well, you owe us some extra tax. Okay. And that's where the pro process of capital gains tax comes from. But it's, it's important just to note that yes. primary residence, your yeah. first house, the one that you live in, that is excluded from capital gains? Absolutely. Second homes, in your name, you're subject to capital gains. 100%. Once you sell it, which is based on a percentage of the profit made. So if you bought for 100,000, you sold for 200,000, then your profit is 100,000. Capital gains up to 25% of 100,000. Now, what they've done to simplify it as well, in, in exactly what you've explained now, as far as the entrepreneur is concerned, yes. the inclusion rates to be used depend on the status of the entrepreneur. So individuals okay. and special trust, it's between 0 and 10%. Right. If you go to companies, it's 14%. Right. Uh, small business corporations, also 14%. And trusts yes. work up to 20%. Right. So again, anything that it comes It depends on the that, entity. Okay. Yeah then right. you have to basically pay for that. So I think that's another important aspect to, to, to recognize. Now for an entrepreneur, you do not have to worry much about capital gains tax because it comes much later in right. your, um, as, your, as your company or your, your business increases. Right. And I think that's very important to understand. So you're not gonna encounter a lot of that. You will encounter the VAT part of it, which I think is very, very important. Then, now, now is it correct that um, in a business <coughs> enterprise that owns intellectual property or trademarks or patents, that when you sell the property, you can exclude that from the overall amount of the sale. Is, is that your understanding of it? Um, I would think so to a certain extent. I'm not familiar with it okay. with that area, but I would think so that, that, that in terms of, of the sale, um, certain portions of that can be excluded. But again, I think that has to be the agreement between the buyer and the seller in right. terms of what, what uh, actually evolves there. So um, that's not an area I'm very comfortable with. Okay. But, uh, 
it's something I can learn about. All right. So what is deductible expenses then? Well, the deductible expenses basically come in the trading of, of the business. Whatever right. expenses you incur. Oh, we covered that uh, yeah, to an basically. extent. Okay. So the next point I'd just like to raise is the registration of an employee as pay, pays you and PAYE. Very, very important. Right. And but not just important. PAYE. No. It's uh, comp compensation for, uh, for injuries. Yeah. I think that we can cover maybe a bit later, later because of time okay. constraints. But right. just to give for, for the layman again, the, the registration of an employer as, as PAYE that you're going right. to pay as you earn on, on behalf of employees on your, um, in your organization or business. Now, here again, there's certain forms that have to be filled in okay. or that you have to have um, on your, on your, in your organization. Mm -hmm. The first one is the IRP2 form. Okay. Completed by all staff members giving full personal particulars. Okay. So you need to have that form. Then the IRP4 form to cover the monthly return of deducted employee tax, okay. which you have to submit on a monthly basis to SARS. The mm -hmm. IRP5 form to reflect the annual earnings, the pensions, the PAYE, uh, PAY the UIF, medical aid, all the deductions of the employees for the year. Right. And again, it's very important so that we also stipulate to, to the viewers that you must look at your, your, your periods mm -hmm. um, in the sense that the business cycle in South Africa runs from the first of or the 1st of March until the 28th of February. Right. The reason for that is people wait for the budget. Yes. And they see if any changes in the budget and then accordingly they will basically change things in terms of, of um, any changes that need to be made in the business right. arena as well. So I think that's important to understand. So the IRP5 forms, uh, forms are important, but then you also get what is called an IRP5 subsection 6 form. Okay. Those are booklets that are given to companies um, and a record and stock taking must be kept of all the IRP5 forms that are basically handed out. Okay. So it, I think it, there's a number sequence and so forth. So SAS can come and check on that and see that you've complied right. with that. And then lastly, you get the IRP10, right. which is your uh, deductible tables, your tax mm -hmm. deductible tables that come through every uh, year so that you can see exactly that you've basically um, taken the right amount of tax of every single employee that's working for you. Okay. Excellent. Now, we spoke, we spoke of PAYE, and what else do we need to know the with regard to SARS? Well, that's where SARS stops, basically. The next aspect is to look at the skills levy. Right. Now, what is important with the skills levy, and this is something that companies may, I think they do know, or they're not using it effectively, but if you basically have um, a situation where um, you are able to train your staff and, and I know there's thresholds that we, we need to look at. Right. So you must basically be fam uh, familiar with the Skills Development Act and the Skills Development Levies Act. Okay. Now what happens here is that if you're in a position to have your staff trained yes. and you have a certain threshold, I think of 150,000 rand or greater, then you pay 1% of your total salary bill yeah. per month, but you cannot deduct it from your employees. Yes. Right. So you pay that salary or that, that uh, to over to the to SARS. Yes. And that portion is basically a kind of a rebate. Now, if you understand correctly, what happens is that because you find yourself in a certain sector, yes. let's say you find yourself in, in um, the merchandising sector, yeah. then you belong to what is called a, a Maseta, which is the Merchandising Sector Education Authority. Right. And what happens then is that Sector Education Authority is where you can have your company's employees trained. Right. In, in aspects of merchandising and purchasing and so forth. Okay. So what happens then is the skills development levy is actually paid over to the CETAs, right. partly. And once you people go for the training or learnerships, as we call it today, you can actually claim it up to about 80% rebate okay. that you get back. And I, I don't know if companies are basically not, I wouldn't say not, but I hope they're using this effectively because it's a very f good form of empowering and upskilling your staff. Right. But at the same time, getting something back in return because of the money you're applying in initially. Right. So that's also something to consider at the end of the day. Then the last part, I think, is comes to contracts. In here, I think it's very important for a business person to understand what a contract is. Yes. When can you enter into contract? Who's right. able to enter into a contract? Okay. Um, when do contracts become voidable? When do they become, become enforceable? Right. Now it's that simple jargon that can be very confusing because sometimes agreements are made on a handshake. That's true, yeah. And that can be very dangerous because then it becomes a he said, she said issue. Yes. Whereas a contract becomes binding on both people. Yes. And in the process, um, you make sure that you're covered and the person that you're entering into contract with is make sure that they're covered as well. Right. So I think it's those kind of little aspects that a trader or a business person 
or a businesswoman for that matter also mm. needs to be basically be aware of because you could get yourself up in a total legal mess as you mentioned earlier and and your legal expenses can basically soar because you don't know what you're doing yeah. again simple go and ask somebody before you're going to do it so you're first in advice and you make good informed decisions as well okay Look, I mean, uh, most people would, would consider this a, a legal minefield and they might be put off. I mean, South Africa has been criticized as being one of those countries where it's very difficult to start up a business. I think sure. we rank 147. There are other the areas like correct, yes. uh, Ghana and those people where you can get cracking in two or three days. You get your paperwork sure. done and you can get on. Because a Absolutely. businessman's primary exam... Uh, a focus is to get on with the business and make a profit. We, you know. It has been stated in this country that for, for our country to grow and our economy to grow, we need to promote entrepreneurship. Right. It's very, very important yes. and vital. And to do that, we have to basically look at models of what has worked overseas. Now, from my understanding, I read, uh, did some research on this. In Singapore, for example, yes. you have a person that has a shop. So let's say just behind me, there's a full faceted shop yeah. that has stock inside yeah. and on the pavement yes. you have a person that is selling the same items. Okay. Now in the South African context yeah. you're going to start the war. Yes. But in terms of competition yes. when research was done to find out why this person has set up a business right in front of her, yes. a shop that is selling the same yeah. kind of items, the answer was very simple. I want to move from here to there. Okay. So we have the dual economy in this country, yeah. the black black market economy in terms yeah. of that you have your formal economy and informal economy. We need to look at those okay, aspects. Mohammed, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Okay, I, I only have <laughs> seconds to thank no you problem. for a very interesting topic. Obviously, for the something we couldn't finish tonight in one go. We will revisit with part two of this. As you can see, Mohammed is extremely passionate and knowledgeable about the law that an entrepreneur needs to comply with. Just takes uh, one more opportunity to say thank you very much for having attended. Shukran for the opportunity to be here. I'm sure our viewers have benefited. Thank you very much to the viewers for having joined us tonight. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.